Hi everyone, welcome to Woolen Spinning. My name is Rachel. I can be found pretty much everywhere as well for pearls. And I just want to thank you so much for being here today. It is Wednesday, November 20th. It's 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We are no longer in daylight time. We are now in standard time again. So um, we went back on our clocks a couple weekends ago. I think it was not this past weekend, but the weekend before. And we are live streaming here. We've got um, people from our Patreon community who are here and they're already chatting away. Thank you so much for being here, you guys, and for taking some time out of your day so that you can spend it with me. Um, I really appreciate it. I came off nights yesterday morning and I got, I, there's a whole bunch of um, regulations um, in British Columbia for nurses and we have to get flu shots if we want to continue to work through the flu season. So I had my flu shot yesterday at work and um, I yesterday so I came off nights came home went to bed and I just felt terrible all day and it's just my body mounting an immune response but I was a little bit worried because I was like what if I get sick and I can't live stream <laughs> because that's like all that matters is being able to do the live stream because I look forward to it so 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 much so thank you everybody for being here I really appreciate it I just realized I never pulled up my show notes so we're gonna get those going. These are not the right show notes. <laughs> Our printer is still on the fritz. My husband and I actually don't know why it's not working. We can't, we've tried everything and we don't really wanna get a new printer. So we may actually just go without a printer from now on and you know, cope, deal with it basically. Um, so I'm assuming we're not having any technical issues or anything because you guys are chatting away in chat which is wonderful welcome to everybody who's there we've got rebecca karma kelly diana san eve hi eve um jess oh hi jess it's good to see you and um becca and Britta and charlotte and mari um, oh, I'm sorry that you're homesick, Mari. That's really too bad because I know that you were supposed to be working. And Judy and Sarah. Oh, my goodness. I feel like we've got like everybody here. <laughs> um, thank you so much, you guys, for being here. It just means means the world to me. So let me just move things around. Um, in today's show, like I said, we've got we've got a really full show. Um, I wanted to I've got like a table full of things here. So I have the office set up so that we're on like I have we, we don't really have like a desk. We use a an Ikea table to have all the computer equipment on and the office is a bit of a mess right now because my husband's in the process of building us a new computer and so he's been like ordering parts and figuring out you know what he wants to do and what he wants the new computer to operate like and look like so we're in a bit of a transition stage in the office right now and um so I got a, a big piece of like plywood <laughs> from the garage I just like took it I don't know if he needs it or not. He hasn't said anything. Anyways, I put it on the side of the table to like extend the table and I use some of our C clamps to like clamp it down just because I don't want it to like, well, basically fall off. And so now I have like this big table, this big space to be able to like spread out all the things. So um, I obviously you can see here, I've got a lot of stuff to share with you today. And um, I also have da, 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 my finished cardigan. So we'll talk about that as well. Um, I think I wanted to talk really quickly about the giveaway. So I'll maybe do that before we run the intro. Um, and then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get into the show. So, um, for the giveaway, I was going to make a big bat for this month's giveaway. Um, I had announced it last month, sorry, last episode in episode 128. And I'd said that I was going to make some bats and because I've been trying to stash bust and use up some stuff. I actually gave a fleece to a friend. I just, I know I'm not going to get to it. And I, I just gave it to her. She wanted to know if she could pay me for it. And I was like, just take it. Um, I had offered it to somebody else. They weren't able to take it at this time. And then I offered it to someone else and they, they took it. I just have been really trying to spend some time thinking about what I want to make, what I want to spend my time making the direction of the show and what I want to spend my time talking about on the show and sort of what that all looks like. And um, this, I'd had the fleece for quite a long time and it's not clean and um, I decided to move it along. So 
I didn't get a chance to pull out my drum carter and whatnot because I was going through, I've been going through my stash and like basically airing it out, but trying to figure out what I have. And so I'm actually going to do the bats and everything, but I'm going to work on them later this week for our December and January giveaways. So what I actually thought was I still have that huge, massive bag of Shetland that I got from my friend uh, Lori, who's um, the rancher of Disdero up in the interior. And I've talked about her lots on the show and you guys um, who've been around for a long time know who I'm talking about. Anyhow, it's such a massive amount of fiber in that bag and I've given away a little bit of it already. And the whole idea was to give some of it away. So I think it was Hannah who got um, the last bump. So I pulled off another four ounces. So this is a full 115 grams of Shetland. It was prepared by the mill in Kamloops, which is I think called That Darn Yarn Shop. I think that's what it's called. Mari, maybe you can help me out. And um, it's comb top. It's sort of more of like a roving. I don't, it's not really paralleled fibers. I think it's, it's sort of in between. Anyways, if you, so that is going to be the giveaway for this month. So I will send this to somebody after we draw a name from the episode thread for November in the Ravelry group, and I will send this to somebody who, who I draw. Um, the way that I have been spinning it is actually, let me move some of this stuff out of the way. Like I said, I have so much to share with you today. Um, let's move that out of the way, move that out of the way. So these were some of the woven samples that I had done from this yarn that I've been sampling to try to figure out like how I was going to spin it. So one of them is I had spot, I had woven it without washing before I, so I, I, I skeined the yarn, wove with it, but I didn't wash the yarn first. And then I washed the swatch afterward. And then the other one, I washed the yarn and then wove with it. And the swatches actually are no different. They're, they're basically exactly the same. And then I also did a three ply sample and this yarn would be just an incredible sweater yarn. This is just the yarns round and it's I, I was going to say dense, but it's not. It's strong. I think that would be the best way of describing this yarn. It's it's a strong yarn. So there's that. And then I had done a really big sample of two plies. So this is the two ply yarn that I'd spun. And this yarn is actually the yarn that I'm going to continue to spin to eventually weave a massive blanket and I'm thinking that it'll be in some sort of a point twill you know where you get like those little mountains in the weaving um, it'll be 45 inches wide um, it'll probably be about 12 ends per inch and because I have so much fiber I'm just basically gonna spin and uh, yeah so what I have been doing to for the prep part is this is my current bump that I'm working on and I haven't been spinning on a very high ratio I think I've only been spinning on like 12 to 1 or something on my Lendrum so I've been taking the fiber and I've actually been splitting it in half because this is pin drafted uh, it's when you split it in half and then pre-draft it and pre-attenuate it it really makes a nice prep and then I've been spinning from that. And as I've been spinning, I've been thinking like light, airy, don't strangle the fiber, keep it really lightweight. Um, and that's what created this yarn that I love so much. And that's what created these really beautiful woven swatches. So, and these are a little bit, I think these are like when I measured them, I think they were like, before I washed them, I think it was like 10 dents per inch and 10 picks per inch. So that's why I was thinking, and you can see, you can see through it, like you can see me. And so I was thinking that 12 ends per inch would probably be a, about right. And I have a 12 dent reed, so it's perfect on my big jack loom, my, my big floor loom. For those who are new and um, are new here, I have two looms at the moment. Um, I have my 24 inch Leclerc Compact, which is back here. And then I have a 45 inch Leclerc Nihilus loom that's uh, Jack Loom. So those are, unfortunately they're both Jack Looms. Um, I was sort of hoping that one 
while I was really hoping for a 45 inch counterbalance, sorry, countermarsh, um, but maybe one day. I've been looking at wheels. I know I'm terrible. <laughs> I've been looking at spinning wheels, so I'm like, okay, I, there's definitely not a new loom coming into my life anytime soon, but um, I've been looking at spinning wheels because you know, I get rid of them and then I buy more more spinning wheels and then I get rid of them and then I buy more. So anyways, there's, you just, there's always something. You just have that like want not syndrome, you know? You just always want something. And the reality is most of the time we don't really need it. But it's so fun. <laughs> All right. I actually forgot um, one of the yarns because I was reskating them. Um, they're actually in the hallway. So while we run the intro, I'm going to run out and grab the skeins of yarn that I need because they're done and I wanted to talk about them today. So let's um, get into the intro and I will grab my yarn. Hi, I ran like the wind. Okay. Oh, hi, Tessa. Hi, Judy. Good to see you guys. I am still on the Lendrum list, Judy. Um, I, I don't know if he's ever going to do another run of those Saxony wheels or not. I have no idea. Um, one of the things that... So let's talk about wheels for just for a second, then we'll, and then we'll get into some of this other stuff. Um... Um, so I had sold my Kromsky Minstrel years ago to be able to buy the Shacked Matchless and also a Sidekick um, and I also ended up getting a Lendrum. So I had sold my Minstrel. It never really... I think because I was a so such a new spinner, I didn't know what I didn't know and I certainly did not appreciate that wheel at all and its potential. I still wish that I had kept it. Um, so, and you know, it's it, it's not because it's like the best wheel on the market by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, I think I think one of the really important things about all of these different tools is they're they're tools, and you can spend as much or as little as you want, and they're sort of these in between uh, tools that are really affordable and will last a really super long time, probably your whole spinning career you know career quote unquote and I didn't appreciate that some of these companies like Lendrum, Kromsky, uh, Ashford really offer a great price point for an affordable tool um, that's accessible to a lot of people and the potential that that wheel had. So I moved it along and I got the Lendrum and then shortly after I was able to get a sidekick secondhand, I got a matchless secondhand and then I became a Spinolution deal dealer for a bit, which just became like a bit too big. It was too much of a, a monster to cope with with two really little kids at home. And so I ended up letting that part go. But one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot was, you know, and then I got a Hanson um, for a little bit and that really wasn't the right wheel for me. I do not have any regrets about moving that wheel along. So then shortly after I added um, the Ashford E-Spinner 3 and I ended up selling that because I just wasn't using it. And as I've been looking back at all of this stuff, so now I've got my Magicraft Susie, which I'll never sell, and I've got my Upright Lendrum, which I'll never sell. But there's a couple of things that I sort of am really missing. So I missed Double Drive on my Minstrel and the Matchless. And I really miss the portability of having an electric wheel and be able to plug in a battery pack and just take it with me. Felicia has the Ashford E-Spinner 3, so Sweet Georgia Felicia taking back Fridays. She's a really dear friend of mine and her battery pack, she was saying like it lasts a huge amount of time. For me to be able to plug in like that and to take it with us when we go camping and whatnot would be really amazing. Because as it is right now, 
I can't do a lot of spinning when we're away other than like on spindles, which is great. But if I want to get like a production spin done, um, it's a it's more challenging. And the double drive thing is has been kind of really bugging me for lack of a better dis- description um, because I spin a lot of long draw and I really miss having the ability to to do that and to use double drive. Um, there was something else I was going to say about that. So anyways, so these are all the things that I've been thinking about and I... Um, you can get the overdrive head for the Magicraft, but because of taxes and importation and the cost of it, it actually makes more sense to just get another wheel. So that's where these, these thoughts have been coming from. What I want to spend my time making, what I want to spend my time doing, the content that we're creating here for the show, etc., etc. So, yeah. Um... Yeah, it's true, Diana. Diane, um, last year whole spin career, except that we add and subtract along the way. It's so true. Um, if I ever get a second wheel, it's prob- it's definitely a toss-up between the menstrual and the lendrum. See, we'll spend some time. Maybe I'll make a vlog for Patreon for you guys um, about this topic and about sort of where these tools sort of fit into my making and why so all this different stuff is sort of the things that I've been thinking about. Like if that would be helpful, I will do that for you. And we can talk about, Rebecca, that's a great question about why double drive is better for long draw. It's not better. It's just a slightly different way of spinning. I find I can get into a rhythm with double drive and you, I can spin faster in double drive um, doing long draw. I just find that I'm more even, I'm more consistent. And if I have a huge amount of fiber prepped, and I can really get into a rhythm. I find that push and pull of the wheel um, really positive and like it really, um, I can get a lot of yarn spun in in quite quite a short period of time. The thing is, is double drive, scotch tension, Irish tension, all this stuff has its place and I miss the variety. I miss having the ability to go back and forth. And I've looked at the flat iron, but from a footprint perspective, it's too big. So I will keep you posted. I'll do a separate vlog for Patreon um, for you guys to sort of delve into this topic a little bit longer. Maybe we'll do a special live stream in December or something and and talk about just just this topic. Um, Because yeah, it's something I've been really thinking about a lot. Okay. Okay, that would be great, Jess. So she said that that would be great. So if that would be really helpful, please let me know. Comment below. Let me know. So I got James. He had a five-day week weekend a, um, a couple weekends ago because he was sick. And we had some time off because it was Remembrance Day here in Canada. And he did some weaving. And I wanted to share it because he did such a great job. So this is his weaving. It's just like stashed, you know, junk yarn. Um, the yellow is actually Malabrigo singles and we use that as warp and we put this on my little sample at loom that's actually my mom's but I've been borrowing it for an extended period of time and then he kind of petered out um he got a little bit he was feeling better and he was getting more active again and he sort of petered out around here but it's really this is all his weaving in here and isn't that amazing he's seven uh he's seven and a half as of next month and um that was sort of the beginning down here I did the hem stitching for him and then he started off weaving way too tight so I told him to just loosen up a little bit not not push the beater so hard and then he really you know he had a couple of skips and stuff but but he you know he did quite well and then from here all the way up to here which is where he stopped because you can see he made some mistakes and he started to get frustrated but all of this is his weaving and he did beautifully and then I finished it off for him because he just wanted to get it off the loom so isn't that cool? He did a great job. It's just, it, he originally he wanted a little scarf and then he was like, no, I want a blanket for my lovey. So he's been keeping this in his bed, but I confiscated it and gave it um, a light wash. I, um, you know, did the fringe for him and uh, I told him I was going to talk about it on the podcast and then he could have it back. So he was quite pleased that you guys were going to see it. So, all right. I have... Um, yeah, he did do awesome. Thanks, you guys. I think, you know, he's seven, and that was on the samplet, the the smallest samplet 
from, or the, yeah, the samplet, the knitter's loom from Ashford. And um, he, he can do it. Like he completely got the hang of it. It's easy peasy for him. He has no problems with it whatsoever. And um, yeah, it was, he's done, this is his second weaving. The first one was significantly worse, but now he's just that little bit older because it's been a few months and um, he was able to do it. So definitely if you're thinking for kids, he's seven and he has no problems. He just starts to get bored. You know, it gets long. Their attention spans are short. So yeah, the kids just love this stuff. We've got a demo for the grade eights in January at the middle school that's associated with my kids' school. And um, the kids are always so enthusiastic. So yeah, kids just wanna learn. All right, for breed and color studies, we are on to our new breed and color studies. Fiber has been mailed out. People who want to participate but didn't wanna buy fiber or weren't able to, just grab some organic Polworth and jump into the Ravelry group and into the thread and share your projects. It, you don't have to purchase fiber just to participate. You can process a raw fleece if you want to. You can get some um, comb top from somewhere. You can make your some bats, it, it doesn't matter. We're just looking at organic Polworth and we will be running this study into the spring. So. Our very first project was posted uh, yesterday, actually. I think Meg. I don't. Oh, there's Meg. Yeah, you're in the you're in the um, in the chat. So she uh, finished this yarn off. I think over the weekend, Meg. Is that right? And she, um, I just love this. This is just the epitome. This spiral plied yarn is just the epitome to me of what spinning is all about that we're just having fun and we're learning and developing our skills sharing with others being excited for one another being enthusiastic um i saw it and it just made my heart sing and katrina who many of you know crafty jacks um she had actually just been working on a spiral ply herself she'd made this great Bat. She posted the photos in the Slack channel, so have a look if you're a member of the Slack channel. Um, she had posted these photos of this this bat that she'd done, and she spiral applied it. And then I came um, to the Slack channel and looked, and Megan had done the same thing. And it just, you know, just to see that that fun and that enjoying in the moment is just really great. So this is what Meg said. So. I'll just read out what she wrote about the project because she did a gradient spin as well with the main colorway. So we've got two colorways this time around and I'll show you the original braids because mine are sitting right here next to me. So Meg says, I made two yarns. For the white fiber, I stripped it into sixths and I took care not to spin them end to end with the same color first, but at random. I made a thick and thin singles. For someone that is normally a consistent sweater spinner type, it was weird to just let go. I think that is so awesome. Then I did a spiral ply with a 100% silk sewing machine thread in the wine color. And it's funny because that wine color, I think right now with the stream has got the gradient yarn up, but the wine I think really picked up on the brown and the red in the underlying colorway of the braid because the whole idea of this study was to look at how brown would change the colorway and how white would change the colorway and you can really see in this photo that the that wine color in the silk thread really makes the blue pop makes that teal blue really come forward um, and it creates a certain overall homogeny which I think is really is why it's so effective so well done Meg I love how it keeps the white and colors just barely blended and intact. Did, I was wondering, Meg, if you had pre-drafted when you made this, or did you just strip it, strip it down, and then spin? So, if, um, Meg, if you uh, um, have a minute to to let us know how you prepped the fiber, besides just stripping it into this the sixths. For the full color braid, I broke it into color segments and then spun the color segments together end to end to two different bobbins and then made a two ply gradient. So when you look at her gradient yarn on the Knitty Naughty in particular, so the next, this is on the bobbin, but then the next photo is on the Knitty Naughty. To the untrained eye, it actually looks like a three ply because it's the colors are so well preserved. So 
Meg's spinning was very consistent and the weights of all the different colors was cons very consistent. And that's how she ended up being able to get such a, 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 a lack of color blending between the different colors as she changed through the gradient because she was consistent in her spinning and there was probably a very close weight between all of the different colors. Like the blue was probably evenly divided and then she spun really evenly, if that makes sense. So really well done, Meg. I did high twist singles and high twist two ply at about a thick fingering weight. So maybe light sport heavy fingering, Meg. I spun short forward worsted. So she's creating a, more, a slightly denser yarn. And she had only spun Polworth woolen before. So she was surprised about how shiny it was when it was spun worsted project to come. So I'm curious, Meg, to know uh, if you have any project ideas, like do you know what you're going to do with that yarn? And she didn't pre-draft, she only stripped it. So very, very interesting um, because part of the way that she was able to preserve those colors in that thick and thin was by not pre-drafting. So she got sort of these chunks of relatively clean color. Now I have my braids sitting right here within arm's reach because I have been really having a tough time trying to figure out how I'm going to spin them. So this is the braid that has the white and the brown added to it. This is what that looked like. And you can see those colors in Meg's skein there and how clean she was able to keep them by doing what she did. So no pre-drafting and she just stripped them and spun. And you can see how the brown in that colorway just creates a little bit more interest. And with that wine colored thread, it just makes that teal really pop. And then this is the original colorway that we're comparing against. Pretty cool, huh? So she was able to, because of the gradient, she was able to keep those colors really super clean. And then because she was spinning really consistently, um, she was able to preserve the underlying colorway, which is really neat. Well done, Meg. So I love seeing these spins. The, the Breed and Color Studies to me is like, yeah, we're not spinning from fleece. Um, you know, there's no feasible way to do that um, on the scale that we do the breeding color study in our group. But to be able to see all these different projects and all these different spins, there was, um, I think, was it you, Sarah, who put in the Slack channel this morning her project that she's spinning for? Same colorway, same braids, and she's made completely different yarn. So we'll share that next show. So really well done, you guys. Um, I think it's just amazing. Um, she hasn't finished her yarns yet. Um, she'll finish after weaving, um, just like Judith Mackenzie McEwen, which is awesome. So she's doing an experiment. Um, I thought I would do surgery on the singles to break them and get the colors to match, but they didn't. She just spun and they matched up perfectly. Never had that happen before. So that's awesome. She didn't. She didn't have to. Uh, do a lot of color management and break singles and throw them out. So she probably actually made what happened was two things. One, you had an equal weight, an equal amount of fiber between all the different colors. So the blue, the red, the yellow, it all was like a relatively equal amount. And so then when you spun your, to your bobbin, because you were spinning so consistently, you ended up with a two singles that were very, very, very similar. And that's why you had all that color match matching, which is really well done. So, okay, we are going to move on. I wanted to talk about my finished objects. And so I thought we would start with my yarn. I think in the show notes it's reversed, but I have to move cameras around so that I can talk about my Marie Chen behind me. So I think what we'll do is we'll finish up here on the table and then I'll move the cameras and we'll finish off with my cardigan if that's okay. Um, I do have a couple of works in progress, but I wanted to talk about this spin first because this is finished and um, this is my Falkland and I had bought this fiber at Knit City back in October and I usually don't work with fiber that I buy quite so quickly. like buy it, get it on the wheel that night and start spinning it immediately. That's not really my MO. But for whatever reason, 
this just really spoke to me and I wanted to start spinning it right away. And then I was able to get it plied this weekend. So I just sat quietly and I just got it plied. I didn't really work on anything else and it was just really nice to sit and ply. So this fiber was 100% Falkland. It was from my friend Lynn, who's West Coast Color, and she's up in Tappan, BC. And her website is, I think it's westcoastcolor.org. I had bought this when I was with... Um, my friend Mari, and actually the total weight, I don't actually know what it is because I've been going through, I didn't finish skeining it, so I have like this big monster skein here, which is probably about 600 yards based on these other three littler skeins that I've made, but I didn't get this skeined because of not feeling great yesterday and having that sort of little blip of my immune system having to work in overdrive for 24 hours. I woke up this morning and I wasn't particularly well recovered. Um, I am taking, this is a little bit off topic, so just bear with me. I am taking a five week course and it started last night on Olympic weightlifting. So I have done quite a bit of Olympic weightlifting in the past. And of course, if you want to join a CrossFit gym, you generally have to do some sort of a foundations course or an on-ramping course. And so the CrossFit box that my husband and I are affiliated with, we're not members and we don't um, pay a, like a membership fee because the classes, the times and stuff don't work for us. And CrossFit memberships tend to be quite expensive because they have affiliate fees and the gyms are quite extensive to have to run. There's a lot of equipment. And, um, but every so often, every six months, they offer these five week courses and you don't have to be a member. You just have to be affiliated with the gym. Um, to tweak your skills. So they'll do like a gymnastics course and they'll do an Olympic weightlifting course and they'll do a foundations course. And it's just for people who want to improve. And so I had my first session last night. It was amazing. But because I wasn't feeling great, I really want to get all this rescaned and get it sort of organized so I know what my yardage is. And I just didn't feel up to it. So because my recovery was so poor this morning, I was still in the red zone this morning and I had been in the red zone yesterday. Um, I actually laid down for half an hour this morning after I dropped the kids off and so I didn't get this done. But I feel a lot better <laughs> and um, it made me sort of realize like I've got to really look after myself. So um, it was that time of year. So this big monster skein is probably about six yards, 600 yards. And then these three littler skeins um, have all been re-skained and they are each respectively 336 yards, 300 yards, and 308 yards. So this is a th this is 900 yards right here. And then this is the other one, which I think is roughly between six to 700 yards. So I have a ton of yarn. And my original plan, and this is the, I wanted to show the pictures of what the original fiber looked like and then how I broke it down. I pre-drafted all these little nests and then this is the resulting yarn so that you guys could see kind of the evolution of how the colors spun up and how they worked up. Because at Knit City, I had bought these two little uh, skeins of silk mohair. And the idea was that I was gonna hold a strand of this with a strand of this, and I was going to knit the Copenhagen by Petite Knits. So I'm gonna do some swatching. I'm pretty sure I'm not gonna do that. Um, the more that I spun and the more that I reflected on the clothing that I wear and the stuff that I wear and the things that I like, I'm not sure that that's the right pattern for me right now. Um, especially because I just finished this and it's a very similar color. Um, and so talking about capsule wardrobe and all that kind of stuff in the wool stream recently, it's really made me think like, what are the items in my stash that I'm going to use the most? And what am I going to um, what's, what's, going to get used the most that I'm going to really enjoy and how can I maximize that so one of the things that I 
had been thinking about was I found I, I picked up a copy of this. It's brand new. It's called To the Point The Knitted Triangle. It's by Layla Raven Raven. I'm gonna drop this on the floor for just a moment. And basically it's a beautiful book. I picked it up from my local yarn shop because I don't tend to buy any yarn, which you guys know. So I try to support my local yarn shop by still getting my accessories and like any books that I want. I try to get them through through Sue. And so I was flipping through and one of the things that has become really important to me is choosing knitwear to make that is very much to show off the yarn. And so as I was flipping through this, I kept coming to this pattern here called Hyssop. I think that's how you say it. I'm not really sure. Hyssop, Hyssop. Anyways, it's got these wrap stitches. I hope you guys can see that. All of these little points of the, of the diamonds are wrapped. And there's tons of different patterns in here and whatnot. But I was sort of thinking about this idea of showing off our hand spun because the thing is if I hold the yarn with some mohair it's going to make the stitches really fuzzy and you're not really going to be able to see the yarn underneath and I was thinking about that when I was planning the project and it's been kind of plaguing me ever since so I ripped out to reclaim the yarn one of my sweaters that I had knit years ago and talked about on the podcast and started knitting that shawl pattern this past weekend and um, I just love it. Isn't that amazing? So this is Kramer Yarns Roving. It's a Merino Alpaca Blend 50-50. I had done a review on it quite a few years ago. And I had knit it into the Shoreline Vest. And I never wore it. And I thought about ripping it out a couple years, about a year ago. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll reblock it. I'll rewash it. Um, and then I'll wear it, but I never did. I did wash it and reblock it. I just never wore it. And so I reclaimed the yarn because this is one of my favorite yarns that I've ever made. And I started knitting and look at how beautifully that stitch, that wrap stitch um, shows off the yarn. Isn't that amazing? I just love this. Now the pattern is actually for an Aran weight yarn and it's knit on five five and a half millimeter needles, which you can probably tell is not what I'm doing. And, oh, what was your question, um, Becca? What a beautiful, oh, just, just saying it's a beautiful publication. Oh, okay, say it like hip. Hissip, hissop, anyways. It's not cabled, um, it's lace, it's, it's a lace pattern. Um, and then the wrap stitches, you're slipping stitches back and forth and literally wrapping the yarn around. It's quite brilliant, I have to say. Um, I'm really enjoying the pattern. Um, sorry, it's a little bit difficult to see there. It's dark, the yarn is very dark. Um, I had dyed it, I had over dyed it. So it was gray originally and then I over dyed it with, shoot, what did I over dye it with? It was a natural dye. Logwood. I over dyed it with logwood. So I'll talk about this more as I um, as I work my way through this project. But the yarn that I just finished really had me thinking because I've got such a huge amount of it. Like I've got just a just a huge amount of the yarn, and I was looking through the book because you know to buy a book like this, like you need to make it worthwhile to purchase it but I came across this and there's a bit of patterning but and a little bit of lace at the bottom but I keep coming back to it again and again and again and I just thought you know with the slight variegation of the Falkland that a pattern like that would not only use up the majority of the yarn and I could always knit until I run out of yarn too because it's a garter stitch border at the bottom um, it would really showcase the yarn. And that really, to me, is the most important part. I don't mind if the knit is a little bit plain to really showcase that yarn. So anyways, I will be talking about this more. That is what I'm working on. <laughs> All these things. I finished, because I had finished Marie Chen, I had to find something that I wanted to work on next. And I just thought, you know, I've been looking at that vest forever. 
and I keep thinking I should rip it and I don't do anything about it. And I finally just thought, screw it. And I ripped it all out. So I had to rewash the yarn and get some of the kinks and stuff out of it. And I was pretty sure, especially after talking to Katrina, I was pretty sure that I would either have to lightly tension it, get it to dry and then rewash it and that would get all the kinks out. But in the end, all I had to do was um, just wash it. I soaked it for about 40 minutes and it actually, the kinks came out. It washed up very well. So I suspect that's the alpaca. Um, because it's dense and it's heavy and it um, really came out well. Now the other thing, I wanted to talk about one more thing before we move on. Last night at Guild, oh the yarn's a two-ply. It's a two-ply yarn. Um, great question Marjorie, I should have said that. So I wanted to talk about this yarn for just a minute uh, and how I spun it because I'm really happy with how it came out and it was very much a spin that was focused on just enjoying the process, sitting down at my wheels, spinning away, spinning my default yarn, short backward, relatively, you know, sort of medium twist, medium ply, and just enjoying the process and just making something for the sake of making it and just really enjoying it. And as a aside I ended up with a huge amount of yardage which is really fun which is really great if it had been a three ply it would have been a little bit less yardage it also would have been a slightly thicker yarn um, so I'm happy that I did the two ply I'm happy I have so much yardage to play with but last night at Gil but one of the, okay let me preface this let me just back up a sec one of the things that I've been really frustrated about with my yarns recently is that I feel like they could be a little bit more, I don't want to say better. That's not what I mean. When I've been looking at my singles, I haven't been quite as happy with them as I want to be. And I think it's because I know that if I spend a little bit more time on the prep, that I will have a slightly better yarn. And we know that the prep really is the make or break. If you have a comb top or if you have fiber roving, it doesn't matter what it is, that it's compressed and you're fighting against it and you're having to reef on the fiber to pull it forward and it's maybe breaking a bit or it's brittle or your yarn's gonna reflect that. And I think that's one of the things that I was thinking about while I was working on this and thinking about like what I want my yarns and my making to look like going forward as we go into the new year, um, what, and Katrina and I are going to be recording for Wool and Spinning Radio for December, sort of our reflections on the year and our hopes and dreams for the new year. And this is what I've been really thinking about is what do I want my projects to look like and my yarns to look like? And I've just been really frustrated and I think this happens in when we are really wanting to improve at something because you sort of plateau for a while and then you make another skill jump and then you plateau for a while and then you make another skill jump and so on, right? It's just this huge continuum. But last night at Guild, um, we had a fantastic presentation by my friend Kim McKenna who blogs over at Clada Fiber Arts. And if you don't follow her blog, please go and follow her because she's a wealth of information. She's a wonderful person. And she did a presentation on spinning from distaffs. And she showed on her wheel what her, and she's a master spinner, like she's, probably one of the best spinners that I know. And she showed on her wheel what it looked like when she spun from non-pre-drafted, just straight off the comb top, and it could, could have been off a woolen prep too, with no prep. So she sat down, grabbed the comb top, and just started spinning. And she passed that sample around, and then she took that same fiber and she stripped it, sort of like this, like just a little strip of fiber, and spun it. No pre-drafting, no prep whatsoever. And this was from like a beautiful prep already. And then she passed that around. And then she took the third sample and she pre-drafted and loaded it onto a distaff and then spun. 
The difference between the three yarns was absolutely striking. And it really comes down to prep. So she sent me home with this, which I had actually borrowed from her about a year and a half ago and I never got a chance to work on it or use it. And part of it was because I didn't really know what to do with it. And she sent me home with some ribbon <laughs> so that I can dress my distaff. And um, I'm gonna play with this and I'm going to report back obviously and let you guys know and show you the samples that I spin. And we'll see if I sort of am able to, for lack of a better term, and I don't mean this negatively, but kind of muscle through this little bit of a plateau that I feel like I've gotten to. Because while this yarn is great and it's quite consistent, um, I think it, I, th I think the prep and the fact that, um, I was probably holding on to the fiber a bit too tightly and like there's all these different things that I was doing that I think took away from what this yarn could have been if that makes sense because it's all about just in making incremental improvements just those little things that we can do to ever so slightly move ourselves along and um, while I'm incredibly happy with this yarn and I just I'm so excited to knit with it. I am very aware that I want to continue to explore this idea of fiber prep. And I've been thinking about it for a while and how to prep my fiber to spin even more consistently. Beautiful distaff, yeah. Um, it is, it's not very long. Um, it's sort of like the width of my shoulders. There's a whole bunch of different ones on the market. Um, Kim has quite a number that she brought and showed and shared. Um, this one, I'm not exactly sure where it came from, but I know that she had purchased it. I have to admit, I would really like to have one of these. Um, I just think it's beautiful. And she added the this at the top to help to secure the fiber. So she pulls the fiber through from here and wraps it around the top and then secures it to the distaff. So um, I'm really excited to kind of explore this a bit more. And um, yeah, she has a distaff that she had custom made for her Magicraft Susie. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about exploring that as well. So yeah, all these things that I'm thinking about, I, I just feel so excited about all this stuff. The other thing too, is I would really like to play around with this prep because when you're pre-drafting and you're loading such a huge amount of fiber onto something that you can sit and spin for quite a long time and you can get into that rhythm that we talked about earlier today, um, her yarns that she spun using a distaff so that she's not holding onto the fiber, because the idea is you're not holding onto the fiber, you're holding onto just a little bit at the end and you're spinning. However, like I have to play around with how I wanna hold this thing and how I want to work with it, because um, she holds it like this, how is she holding it last night? And she spins off like that. She showed a few different ways of doing it. Anyways, I have to play with it. Um, but the Gotland that she spun, because she uses a distaff for everything, um, she had spun some Gotland and the results that she got were incredible. And I have four ounces of Gotland to spin for Sweet Georgia. And I really wanted to explore a different way of spinning it. So I think this might be my answer. So I'll keep you posted. Okay. Oh, you guys, you're so chatty. I just love it. Um, I think the next issue is on prep, actually, Becca. That's a good thought. Um, the next ply issue. <laughs> I guess I am in sync. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I've been so excited about some of the upcoming um, issues of Ply Magazine. There's the basics. Is it basics? The basics issue is coming out in the in the fall of 2020. I'll have an article in that. Um, there's some really exciting topics coming up. It's it's exciting. I almost I find I almost always like the resulting yarn better if I 100% do the if I did 100% of the prep myself. I'm not sure if that's emotional or actual. You know, Kelly, I bet you it's it's actual. Um, I'm finding that as well. When I take the time to really prep my fibers and do it well, even if it's from a commercially dyed comb top, if I take the time to do my prep, um, I find my yarns are better. Yeah. 
Only used a distaff with my spindles. Never used it with a wheel before. Super intrigued. Yeah. Um, so Kim uses one no matter what she's spinning on. And um, that's why I kind of want to explore this because I feel like there's really some knowledge to be gained from, from her. So we're going to move on a little bit because I took last night's ideas and thoughts and this bat was from Katrina. She gave it to me. It was a gift. And she said she made it because she was thinking of, she was, it was after my dad died and she's like, I, I had these colors and I was thinking about you. And so she made this for me. And in the note with it, she said, I put in too much sparkle to make you smile. And um, obviously the color is like, so me. So I pulled it out this morning on a whim based on what we were talking about last night at Guild. And I stripped down just a little bit off of the side of it like this. Just a tiny bit. So I took like a little strip. Let me just get this in. And I just took like a little bit off of the side. And I tried to keep it like as, as tidy as I possibly could. And I just took it down like that all the way down. Um, so that I ended up with this little bit and then I went along and I pre-drafted and added a little bit of a twist just to keep the fibers aligned and keep them really super organized and I started spinning on this spindle that Eric her husband made it's a Turkish spindle isn't that cute the little heart I just think these are so freaking cute I love his Turkish spindles he's doing such a great job um and I started spinning so that's the cop there that I've started and um, I've just been really thinking about this morning. I was thinking about what Kim's presentation was like yesterday and what she was talking about last night and about just keeping it really light and really airy and really trying to sort of let go of my fibers a little bit and not be quite so, not holding my fiber quite so tight. And I don't hold my fiber really super tight, but the yarn that this is making, I just absolutely love it. Isn't that incredible? And I think I will probably ply it a little bit tighter, but it's just making the most amazing yarn. So even though I'm not using a distaff because I don't have a little one that I can use with my spindles and I'm still sort of learning and working through that, um, I'm really excited about this little project and about just sort of thinking about all these things and what I want to do and what I want to make and what I want to spend my time on and sort of how my, my textiles endeavors are going to unfold. So, yeah. So much to share with you guys today. I've been thinking about so many things. We are this close, this close, to unlocking a weekly podcast on Patreon. Um, and that I'm really looking forward to because the, these shows are so jam-packed with all these things that we are thinking about and sharing from the community and things that we're working on. And I'm really looking forward to having that opportunity to sit here with you guys every week and go through all of this. Um, I hope that it's something that you're excited about as well. And I think that having that weekly opportunity to build community, talk to one another, share these projects, share what we're thinking about and the things that we're working through in our making, I, I'm just really excited to um, do that more regularly more so than we already are. There's a couple of questions, so I just want to slow down and um, answer them because you guys have some fantastic questions. Britta says she'd love to see some distaff spinning. Absolutely. We will be doing that in the new year. Um, don't you think that when you really, when you want to be really, really accomplished at something, you always seek to improve? Absolutely. Um, like the differences among being between being a good or a great spinner and an expert spinner. I totally agree, Diane. And you know, we had this really interesting conversation this morning in the car on the way to school, because we got, um, there was an accident. So it took me over 40 minutes to get the kids to school. And like, it's usually only a 10 minute drive. And the kids were late. And I was like, well, there was an accident. A whole bunch of people were late. It just is what it is. Cause we have to go over the highway. So if there's an accident on the highway, it affects all the side streets. And, um, James said, so he's seven, 
and he's sitting in the back and he's obviously thinking about a lot of stuff right now and he had overheard my conversation this morning with my husband about not recovering and being tired and so on and so forth and uh, he was asking about what basically like what it means when you when we talk about being a better version of ourselves every day like when you get up in the morning and you want to be a better version of yourself what does that actually mean and um, we had this great conversation about that and I think that's exactly what it is right every day we make these little tiny tweaks and these little tiny changes that over time affect our habits they affect how we see the world they affect how we interact with one another um, and that moves us moves the dial incrementally toward being the best version of ourselves. You know, I'm a better version of myself today than I was yesterday because of X, Y, Z, you know. Um, and I think that's about our making as well. And that's a lot of what I've been thinking about and around what I want to spend my time making and how I want to approach my my yarns in particular. So yeah, absolutely, Diane. Um, yeah, it is a fun bat. You're right, Meg. It's just really 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 fun um okay interested in learning how this all works what do you mean by incredible oh incredible in terms of what uh marjorie um if you could clarify i'll, I'll answer that question mm. oh kelly you have a eric spindle as well she says she loves her spindle that eric made that's wonderful if you want to spin across the top how would you prep the braid for spinning on a distaff eve um, I want, if you wanted worsted, I imagine you could break the colors apart and run through the combs. If you wanted woolen, you could make a gradient bat. I've done that before. Okay, so you guys are talking about some of the uh, prep for how to spin um, the different approaches to the breeding color study. I don't spin across the top usually, but when I do, I don't split it at all. I generally go across the top when I want to not split color. I just open up the braid as much as possible yeah so if you unfold the braid and open it up as much as possible and actually I think Jillian Moreno just published a nitty spin article about this like this week like I feel like it just popped up on my Instagram feed like in the last day or two you can really open it up now in terms of that way of spinning um Eve is wondering about like in general if you're meaning in terms of like putting it onto a distaff, I would think, I'm going to have to play with it, but I would think you would be wanting to, so the way that you, I think, this might be completely wrong, so bear with me, but if you want to put a bat on a distaff for spinning, you literally like roll it on this is too small to do that um, but like you roll it on and then you spin from the from the bottom here so I suspect if you wanted to spin across the top and do the same thing with a braid um, if this was like opened up and this was a braid like you would pull it through I'm gonna have to play with this like I might just be completely wrong but I've seen Kim do it. Like you would load it, right? And then you would just start spinning and you would just have it really open and really flat. It would almost look like halfway in between a bat and halfway in between a, um, a, a, thin, a thin piece of um, fiber that's been pre-drafted and attenuated and stuff. So we'll have to play with that. Let's play with that. Maybe we'll do like a, what's that word? Do like a experimentation. We'll see how it goes. I'll do some research, do some reading. How would you hold it? You can hold it like this and spin off of here. You can stick it in your belt and spin. So Kim often will put a belt here and she'll stick it through there and she'll spin off. Um, you can pinch it and hold it Okay, so let's say this is let's say this is loaded. Here, hang on. This is the problem with the podcast. We always like delve into these like little like um, rabbit holes. I just love it. This is why it needs to be weekly. <laughs> okay, so if you've got it like this, so it really depends on what your drafting hand is, right? I'm gonna get rid of the webcam for a sec. 
I, I think it really depends on what your what your um, drafting hand is. So if you're holding it like this, the idea is that you're not holding your fiber supply, right? Because you're you don't need to because the distaff is doing that work for you. So then if you're holding it here, then you can just draft off. So for me, it would be like this, and I would draft off like I do spindles, right? I think experimentation is the name of the game here. I think that is really what we have to do. We have to experiment. It's all about learning in the moment. I have no idea if this will work. Bear with me. Yeah, so this is too high. I don't know. I'll have to play with it. I, she had us doing it last night um, at the guild, but we were doing it on a wheel. So we were sitting, but she was demoing doing it with her spindles. So I think really what it is, is just spending that time to play. And this is a little bit too big, I feel, for a spindle. Like I would want a distaff that was kind of like this big, like from here to here. That would That would feel more natural. So, all right. I put it in my belt usually, uh, Becca says. And yeah, so Marjorie was wondering about Kim's spinning of the Gotlin fiber and what made it incredible. Thank you, Marjorie, for clarifying. That's really helpful. Um, was it light, soft, airy? Exactly. So you know how Gotland, we did Gotland as a uh, breed study. Um, it was one of our first ones that we did way back in 2016 or yeah, 2016. And a lot of people reflected that their yarn came out quite wiry and a little bit denser and a little bit ropier. And um, the fibers are a little bit heavier than you would expect from, you know, say Merino or Cormo or something. Um, but the yarn that Kim had spun off of her distaff was really, really um, light and airy. It's next to the skin soft. Um, it just had so much air in it. It wasn't poofy because it's a long wool. It's not going to poof like Polworth will. But it was. Um, it had lovely sheen. Um, it was spun short backward but smoothing the fibers and... Yeah, it was just a beautifully spun yarn. So that was, and a lot of it was because she, you don't have to hold the fiber supplies. So you're not battling with the fiber supply and holding it while you draft forward. Um, you've got something to manage that for you. So we spent a lot of time talking about that last night. Like I think one of the reasons why our spindle spun yarns, particularly our drop spindles, our trigger spindles, create such a great yarn is you've got this tension on the yarn of the spindle pulling on it and uh, pulling those fibers straight um, so that when you take that weight off they they bounce back right and it makes these really bouncy springy airy yarns but the other thing is that we're not holding our fiber supply as we draft you have to put your fiber supply elsewhere so that you can draft and I've long thought that that's part of the reason why I really like my spindle spun yarns is because I'm not holding that fiber supply like I am when I'm on a wheel and drafting forward and holding my fiber supply. So, yeah. Now I have to wind my cop, otherwise I'm going to lose this yarn that I've spun with you guys. Okay, let's talk about my sweater. Oh, hi, Bridget. It's good to see you. Um, do you think it's because you're not actually smooshing it with your hand? The fiber? Absolutely. Yeah. If you can find... Oh, yeah, ring distaffs. That's like a whole other thing, too. Um, I guess I never hold my fiber supply in my hands. It's usually on the floor or something. Right. It might be on the floor, and it might not be like physically in your hands, but you're still holding whatever it is that you're drafting from. So the idea is that now the distaff is doing that work for you, and you're 
drafting off of just that fiber that's at the very tip of the distaff. That's the difference. So it's something to play with. Okay, let me move the cameras around. And we'll talk about my sweater. I've got all this stuff on the floor now from like throwing it all around. Okay, can you guys see that okay? Okay, what do you guys think? Um, you can see me in the Cardi. I have some pictures, so let me just show you that first. So this is me wearing it. Um, this is the original fiber. Here, let me sit down for a minute. This is the original fiber um, that's down below. So I have like the the running photos down below and that was after Katrina dyed it and she uh, did it in the colorway Goldfinch. Um, it's sort of a grello kind of a color and then um, she gave it back to me. And so I did this, this was a two ply yarn. It was from Bats that my friend Diana Twists who blogs over at 100milewear.com. Her and I had processed the fiber from raw, so that's a picture of the fleece. And um, we had made all of these bats and then we divided them evenly and I stashed them. I had them in my stash for about three and a half, almost four years. I didn't spin it um, and I really, in some ways I'm really glad that I didn't and then on the other hand I'm like, ah, oh, I should have. But I didn't, I stashed them. After the whole conversation that we all just had about um, fiber prep, one of the things I think about this yarn that ended up working out really well and why the yarn was such a wonderful yarn to work with and why I was so happy with it after I spun was because the fiber prep was on point. Diana's Carter, um, I can't remember what kind she has. I think it's an Ashford um, standard Carter. It really took the fiber well and it made really great bats. And Clun Forest is a down type breed. It's a, it's just got spongy and it's springy and it's got, it takes the dyes in that slightly chalky kind of way. And it just has that lovely look and feel. And going through the Carter and creating these bats just it was just exactly the right prep for that fiber and so when I was spinning it I did like what I was showing you guys earlier with the bat that Katrina gave me um, I just stripped it pre-drafted it and started spinning and I spun to my default you know I spun short backward I very gently very lightly smoothing the fibers as I went but I was intentionally spinning slightly thicker. I didn't want to have really, really fine, high twist yarn. I wanted a DK, light and airy yarn that, that sort of maximized the yardage of the bats that I had, because I wasn't totally sure how much I would get for yardage and uh, based on the bats that I had. And I just sort of thought, come what may. I've actually ended up with quite a bit of leftover yarn. So I had about 800 yards of yarn and I've ended up with two half balls left. So I had those four skeins and I actually have half of each of them, of two of them left, which is pretty amazing. Um, this, this cardigan did not take a lot of yarn at all. In the pattern, it called for, um, it called for worsted weight, um, I think it was DK weight. Anyways, the, the, the needles called for were four millimeter needles. And um, I ended up using, um, I ended up using five millimeter needles. And part of the reason for that was because my gauge was so different. So when you look at the back, my gauge through here was this 19 stitches per inch, I think or 21 stitches per inch, I'm not totally sure. Anyways, it made 
the the fabric that I got, if I had gone down to four, four millimeter needles, it just would have been way too dense. And I would have lost this nice drape that I've ended up having. Cause you can see how like the fabric is sweater fabric for sure. Um, but it also has, a, it hangs nicely and you can't see, like you, I can't push my fingers through it. Like it's a dense, it's a, it's a proper, you know, sweater yarn. Um, and then it still gave me the stitch definition. So going down to the five millimeter needles still gave me the lovely stitch definition to be able to highlight the yarn. Even though it's a two ply, it still was able to give me the stitch definition. It opened up in the yarn overs like a two ply does. Um, whereas I think if it had been a dense three ply, this wouldn't have opened up very nicely. And I think the whole sweater would have just seemed too dense. So the two ply was definitely the way to go to get that lovely lace to open up, but still gives me nice stitch definition and texture without the density of a three ply because the density of the three ply it just would have been too much um, I think it would have been for this type of fiber for this type of sweater for this knit um, because there's a few things about this sweater like Isabel's patterns so this is Marie Chen by Isabel Kramer um, there's a couple of things like finishing things about the cardigan that just worked out really well like the collar is finished with a stockinette finish and the idea is that it rolls on itself to kind of give the look of a I cord without the bulk of an I cord and if this had been a really heavy dense yarn I don't think this would have worked quite as well I don't think it would have had that lovely look it just would have been too heavy um, and I certainly wouldn't have gotten gauge there's no way so going up to the five millimeter needles um, gave me gauge gave me a nice fabric and I didn't have to make any modifications to the pattern itself. It did knit up slightly bigger than I wanted, but on the other hand, if I'm wearing something like this, that's a flannel button up shirt with long sleeves, it fits and it's not tight. So that worked out really well. I'm just gonna look at chat and see if you guys have any questions. And How much ease does it have? I think um, probably four to six inches. Yeah, so that's the side of my dress form there. And I can squeeze a good two inches out of it. So I'd say probably four to six inches of positive ease. Yeah. I don't like my clothing as tight as I used to. Like I used to wear like clothing that was much, much tighter. And I don't know if it's like an age thing or the aesthetic is changing or if just in general, you know, what, what women want to wear is changing. Cause I find like the fashion now is becoming a little bit asexual, um, you know, sort of more boxy, less form fitting, longer, um, and I certainly like to wear stuff that's got a lot of ease in it. Um, like this has quite a lot of ease. If you see, there's a lot of ease in this, but like it's comfortable and it's still nice enough, you know? So this fits over a shirt like this. And you could see in the photographs, like I photographed it over a flannel shirt, um, to show that there is quite a bit of ease. The one thing I will say, so Monday morning I was working on some stuff and sitting in here in the office and we, we don't keep the house very hot. Um, we keep the, the temperature in the house quite cool. And I was getting quite chilly and I put this on and I was immediately too hot. It is very warm. So that's good. Um, yeah, post childbirth, not wanting to be squished into anything. That's probably true, Diane. Um, I'm having a ton of trouble getting the right amount of ease in my sweaters despite extensive swatching. You know, Sometimes, I think it doesn't matter sometimes how much swatching you do. Um, you're just not necessarily going to get that information from swatching. Do you know what I mean? Like being able to try on a sweater while you're making it, like whether, so that like a top down construction, 
um, so that you can try it on as you go and like when you get to sort of the point where you're about right like this is a top-down raglan right so you can see the raglan here so when you sort of get to like here or here you can sort of start to see and try it on and sort of go like you know that's about right in terms of how I want it to feel and then working backwards to figure out how many stitches to cast on underneath the arm and using the pattern as more of a guide rather than a hard and fast this is what you need to do next um, because I think that that's part of the problem is that a sweat a pattern is a is it's a guide at best all of our bodies are different regardless of where we fall on the scale of um, sort of body type and, and um, measurements. I will say, and I think I said this on the last episode, the absolute best investment that I've ever made, ever, in spinning equipment, sewing, sewing, weaving, knitting needles, the best thing I have ever bought in my entire life is a dress form. The dress form it revolutionized my sweater making and I intentionally keep my dress form at about an inch to an inch and a half bigger than I am so the bust on my dress form is 36 inches my bust is 35 34 and a half 35 the upper bust on my dress form is 35 inches so this measurement across here right in here I'm 33 to 34 inches. The waist I keep at 30 inches, but I'm only 28. Um, and the reason for that is because of taking into account um, underwear um, and clothing. But if you can get a dress form, like, do it. Um, they just make all the difference and then you know as you're knitting you can try stuff on and you can see like you know the armhole like in here um, you know this is the armpit right here right you can see it there in this in the shirt if you try on a sweater and it only comes down to here and you have the whole um, those stitches in the sweater pulling across here you know that it's too small and the the yoke isn't deep enough so then you need to keep on knitting and then you try it on again and you're sort of a bit closer and then you keep knitting and you and you get to here and the stitches are only pulling ever so slightly and then you know that you've got the right ease does that make sense is that helpful maybe that's not even helpful <laughs> i'm going to move so i can see the screen Yeah, and we've been going for a while here, so I um, will uh, say goodbye in a couple minutes here. Um, so let me just have a look at the at the chat, and then we'll and then we'll say goodbye. I have the most trouble with gauge with lace, and how much it changes with blocking. Yeah, you know, I think the thing with lace is that it can change a lot, and when we're doing small four by four swatches, it's just not enough to give you enough information. Um, you know, you can kind of get an idea, but the reality is you kind of need to knit a significant part of the sweater to really know if it's right or not. And if you can get extenders, cable extenders for interchangeable needles so that you don't necessarily have to thread your stitches onto scrap yarn to give you the length that you need to try stuff on. But if you can get interchangeable sets of needles that have cable extenders so they're usually like silver tubes that will extend the cables to give you enough space like I'm talking like 60 or 70 inches of length of cables to extend so that you have lots of space to be able to try stuff on put it onto a dress form whatever that looks like um, and get your partner or your spouse or your best friend to have a look at it and tell you what they think because um, if it's on you it's a bit more difficult to see you can really start to get an idea of what how things are really going to fit, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does help. When I try top-down sweaters on myself, I can't seem to get accurate results, but I can see the helpfulness of putting it on a dress form. Yeah, and I think, too, like I know for myself, when I'm doing a top-down raglan like what's behind me, I know that if I measure on the sweater from my collarbone 
to my underarm, I know that that's seven and a half inches and that it needs to be seven and a half inches on, not that that's my measurement, but I know that on a sweater from here down to here, it needs to be seven and a half inches and that the depth of the yoke from the top of the shoulder down to the bottom of the arm sky, which is your armpit, needs to be eight inches. Like I just know that that's the measurement that it needs to be. So if it's top down raglan, if it's a bottom up, if it's a yoked cardigan it, or sweater or whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. I know that those two measurements, that's what I need. Um, and that's just trial and error. That's just figuring it out um, and figuring out what works for you and being willing to rip stuff out, um, which is a lot of time and energy. But once you know those measurements, then you just create it over and over and over again. And what changes is the patterning and the shape and whether it's V-neck, whether it's a round neck, whether it's long, whether it's got waist sh shaping, like this cardigan doesn't have any waist shaping. It's just straight down. Um, and a lot of that is because of this textured stitch the uh the moss stitch that's in here she just didn't do any decreases in there um it doesn't need any decreases it's a lovely cardigan when it's buttoned it gives you enough shape that you don't need that um so what changes is the is the the template stays the same and the measurements of the sweater stays the same what changes is what we put on top of it it's why software like custom fit works it's because the the base the body the measurements of the body don't change it's what you put on top of it that changes whether it's a v-neck crew neck boat neck open closed steaked not steaked etc does that make sense long sleeves three-quarter sleeves short sleeved yeah a usable swatch yeah absolutely what do you think of knitting a toque or a cowl in a sweat within the sweater pattern as a swatch yeah and then it's like a usable swatch absolutely Jess I think the only thing is if you're not knitting in the round for the sweater and a toque or a cowl is knit in the round your gauge can be different so that just taking that into account because my purled gauge is always different than my knit gauge so if something's knit in the round and it's all the right side and I'm knitting it's going to be different if I purl knit purl knit because I'm working back and forth on a piece so that's something to think about um the most trouble with gay um you guys have such great great questions today i will spin her i will buy her spin enough extra yarn um i suspect is to make sure the way you make that usable object is the same as the sweater round flat etc exactly yeah just you just knocked it on the head absolutely I think your gauge can change when you have a heavy piece of fabric hanging off of the needles, which is very different from swatching. Meg, I think you make a really good point. I think that is part of the problem or the limitations. I should say limitations, not the problem, because gauging, swatching is really important. Um, I think it's one of the limitations of swatching is that your gauge does change as you knit. Um, it's one of the reasons why I like knitting two sleeves at the same time, because generally one of my sleeves is bigger than the other if I don't do that. Um, yeah, these are all things that, that we think about. And tying it back to our earlier conversation, it's all these little things and all these little tweaks that we can make to get better. And that's really what it's all about. So... Great chat today. Um, you guys are just amazing. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for you know participating. It's been a long show and I really appreciate you guys being here and being so engaged in the content and, and chatting right up until the end. It really, really uh, means a lot to me. Um, you know, that's interesting, Becca, or Re um, Rebecca, the knitting more of a six by six or an eight by eight swatch and weighing the swatch after it's dry. Um, yeah, I think um, I think sometimes we can over swatch, you know, and I know a lot of makers out there don't even bother swatching. I didn't swatch for this sweater. Um, I think we put a lot of store in swatching and we sort of say like, you know, swatching is like the be all end all. And I think really 
there comes a point where it can only tell you so much information. And really it's about using our hand spun and working with our hand spun and getting used to how it knits up and what it looks like and working with uh, patterns that we know the base of it is, is right and um, that the measurements are correct and knitting to your body, not just because it says knit X number of rows or X amount of length um, to X measurement. Like if you know, for example, that you need seven and a half inches, your yoke needs to be seven and a half inches deep if you want the sweater to hit you right here at your collarbone because it's a crew neck, stop knitting. <laughs> um, don't keep going if you know that you've sort of hit that measurement and that's where it's going to fit you. You know, stop knitting, divide for the sleeves, knit an inch and try it on and see what you think. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to rip and it's okay to trust your knowledge and to trust your instincts. Yeah. Yeah, see, Jess, in my most successful sweaters so far, I have only knit for as long as my body or as long as I want it to sit and have also pulled in arms the way I want, etc. And that has made a big difference. Pattern guidance versus perfect adherence. Absolutely. Patterns are guidelines. We have to trust our instincts. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we can over plan in all facets of our life. So why not let go of some of that in our making so that we can seek that joy of making, be successful, and learn. Okay. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, you guys, for being so engaged. Um, I, I just so appreciate you guys. We will have we will draw na a name from the uh, November episode thread next episode, so the first episode in December. And tell your friends about the podcast. Make sure you hit subscribe on YouTube. And um, I will talk with you next time. We'll have a new giveaway to announce for December. I have something really fun that I'm wanting to create to uh, do as the giveaway. Um, and until then, happy spinning, happy knitting, and welcome to any new patrons that um, have pledged over the last couple of weeks. You've hopefully received your welcome emails from me, and um, anybody who needed a Slack invite, hopefully you've received that as well. So check your inbox, check your Patreon inbox, and I look forward to getting to know you a little bit better. Until next time, happy spinning, you guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful couple of weeks, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.